I'll do a quick BWA commercial for those of you who don't know. Uh, about BWA, we're, we're a global supplier uh, to the water treatment area. And this is both the industrial water treatment side and also on the oil and gas side. And we're basically, we're very basic in scale inhibitors, corrosion inhibitors, and biocides. A lot of things that we've already talked about today and things we're going to talk about. We did bring some brochures here, so we have some information on one of our newer biocides. And we just launched uh, about a month ago a, a new line of Halite scale inhibitors. So uh, if you're interested in those, just stop by and grab one of the brochures. So I'm going to hand over to Jeff and talk a little bit about the background uh, about MIC and some of the testing that we have done in our labs, and then I'm going to finish up with the case history. So give it to Jeff. Thanks, George. Well, so far today, uh, you know, we've, during the presentations, we've heard uh, a couple of different uh, aspects of uh, issues that occur when you use water under in, in industrial applications. So, you know, you can have scale, you can have corrosion, and you can have microbial issues. So, um, you know, we talked about scale and uh, corrosion or abiotic corrosion. Now we're going to talk about uh, biotic corrosion or MIC, uh, microbial influence corrosion. Um, and the real uh, issue here with uh, microbes in these applications is when they grow on surfaces. So when, when they're in the water, um, you know, in the bulk water, most of the times they don't cause a lot of problems. At least they don't cause uh, MIC. But when they start growing on the surfaces, which bacteria like to do, um, that's when you're going to have issues with uh, MIC. So what are we going to be uh, talking about today? Well, I'm going to do a quick introduction on MIC, uh, how it uh, functions, the organisms that are involved with it. I already mentioned that uh, you know biofilm is an important feature of uh, MIC or important cause of MIC. So we're going to look at um, how we test biofilms in uh, our lab, go through some results, um, then we'll bring George back up and do a case history, and then we'll uh, we'll do a summary. So introduction to MIC. Um, these are some of the you know features of MIC. It can proceed at a very high rate, um, especially even in waters that don't appear very corrosive. Um, it tends to occur localized, so you get pitting uh, corrosion with MIC. So this is you know one of the worst types of corrosion because you can get through wall perforations very quickly. Um, it involves many different organisms and usually a consortium of organisms, but there's uh, one type of organism that's very um, correlated with MIC, and that's the sulfate-reducing bacteria. So here's an example of uh, you know, comparing uh, different mechanisms of corrosion. So here um, on the left you can see an iron key that's in a sterile seawater medium. This is a it's a it's a deaerated uh, application, right? So you know Steve was talking about corrosion that happens with oxygen. You saw that it was very rapid. So under anaerobic or anoxic conditions, corrosion proceeds at a very low rate. So here's 27 months uh, of this iron key in this salt water uh, media with relatively little corrosion occurring. Here's what happens in a very short period of time when you introduce uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria to this mixture. So, uh, you know, A, A and D are the same, you know, the same type of key at the same, uh, you know, the initial uh, point. B is after nine months uh, in the presence of this sulfate-reducing bacteria. And then uh, C is where the corrosion products have been removed chemically and that's what's left of the key uh, after nine months in the presence of uh, sulfur-reducing bacteria. So, um, you know, there's definitely a correlation between sulfur-reducing bacteria and accelerated corrosion under conditions that normally wouldn't be corrosive, you know, uh, anaerobic conditions. Um, the mechanism of uh, of MIC, you know, it's, it's evolved over the years. 
Uh, this slide is, is uh, very busy. It's from a recent publication on MIC. And um, I'll start over here uh, on the left-hand panel. So this is your, um, you know, the theory uh, for abiotic um, corrosion where this was the, the old theory where sulfate reducing bacteria were thought to remove this uh, passivating hydrogen that forms on iron surfaces under anaerobic condition. Um, but it's been proven that this is a very, very, very slow reaction. It occurs, but it really doesn't stimulate um, you know, fast, fast corrosion. It was very slow. Um, the idea now is that um, there's two ways that the sulfate reducing bacteria can um, cause MIC. One is that they use uh, electrons from the corrosion process directly. So there's a certain subset of sulfate reducing bacteria that can um, you know, act actually absorb these uh, electrons as the metal corrodes and use those electrons um, you know, to metabolize producing hydrogen sulfide and then that produces this uh, crust, this corrosion product that coats the surface. Um, so again, you can see you have to have uh, organisms in contact with the surface, you know, biofilm for this to occur. And there's another, uh, another uh, mechanism. Uh, so this is the direct electrical mechanism. This is a, more of a chemical mechanism where again, they're using uh, hydrogen from the surface to uh, reduce organics, they make H2S, and it's the H2S that uh, stimulates, the hydrogen sulfide stimulates the corrosion process. So, um, how do you use biocides to mitigate corrosion in oil and gas uh, pipelines or oil and gas uh, applications? Well, uh, here's a you know a cartoon of, of a corrosive uh, biofilm on the surface of this pipeline. Um, you can see they're generating this pit, and in oil and gas pipelines, it's it's common to uh, pig and uh, batch treat with a biocide. So what you want to do is mechanically clean. So the the pig comes through, removes some of the biofilm. This uh, high concentration of biocide that, that's put in behind the pig um, then uh, tries to control any remaining viable biofilm organisms. This is typically done once a week for a few hours. Uh, the biocide's applied for a few hours as a slug in that pipeline as fluid flows through that pipeline. And what you're trying to do here is, by controlling the biofilm, reduce corrosion of the pipeline. So in fracking is a little different where you know you're putting water down hole. It's you know the fracking process is kind of let's say uh, a, uh, a moment in time. You're putting all that water down and typically you're treating that water as it's going down with the biocide. So it's sort of like uh, one of these extended um, slugs of biocide. And what you're trying to do there is prevent sterilize that water to prevent any organisms from becoming established down, down hole, which could, could cause corrosion, or with the sulfate reducing bacteria through their metabolism, make sulfide and maybe sour the gas or uh, you know, control the product. So um, there's been a lot of work looking at the activity of biocides against uh, biofilms um, by various uh, you know, researchers over the years. Killing, killing the biofilm is somewhat different than removing it. You saw the, the pig uh, in the pipeline helps to remove some of that biofilm, but some might be remaining. And there's not much information on the ability of biocides to remove biofilm. So what we've done is we've, we've looked at both of these aspects of biofilm control killing the microorganisms while they're on the surface and also looking at how do those uh, products, uh, what's their ability to remove those, bio, those organisms from the surface. So I'll just go over quickly how we do this test. Um, we use uh, you know, metal coupons that we allow a biofilm to 
form on these coupons. Then we take these coupons and we expose them to different biocides, different concentrations of biocides for different lengths of time. And then we test those coupons for uh, what's the level of, of viable organisms remaining on those coupons. And then we have a duplicate coupon that we actually stain um, and then look at under uh, a microscope and we look at how many microorganisms are still on the surface of that coupon. So let's take a look at some of these results. Um, there's a lot of data on this slide. I'm not going to go through, through every line, but there's a few things I'd like to point out. Um, you can see here um, in our tests, the control. Um, we've got a high level of, of organisms on the surface. We've got you know, 5 million per square centimeter on the surface. And uh, you know, after an hour of exposure to um, you know, the, the uh, buffer system that we use. You can see that, um, you know, the buffer system is not toxic because after four hours we still have the same level of uh, viable organisms on this coupon. And, uh, you know, these are some common uh, biocides that are used in the oil field industry. This is, uh, this is an, um, an add-back type quad. We have blue aldehyde. We have blue aldehyde with, uh, with an add-back quad kind of uh, combination, uh, a THPS, which is a, uh, a phosphonium biocide, and then we have TTPC, which is another uh, phosphonium quad um, in this test. And if you look down at the results, you can see you need relatively high levels of uh, biocides to get um, killed, to get significant killed with this biofilm. And um, you know, some biocides are, are fairly effective, like the blue quads, get down to below detectable, detectable limits um, in four hours. Um, THPS um, is probably the least effective here. We need to use 100 ppm to get to this, to get a significant level of kill. TTPC is, is fairly effective. We're down to uh, you know, just uh, 30 uh, CFUs per square centimeter. So you, know, you can see there's a um, Different biocides behave differently versus uh, biofilm, and some are some are better than others at killing this biofilm. So that that's the biocidal effect. Now we're going to take a look at the uh, biofilm removal effect. So um, what you see here is um, all of these yellowish greenish yellow dots that are uh, on the surface here, those are, those are actually uh, individual bacteria or bacterial clumps uh, on, these, uh, on these coupons. And here in the control, uh, same, same exposure, one hour and four hours. In the control here, again, you can see that um, these organisms don't just fall off the surface by themselves, right? You can see a, uh, you know, the, the biofilm is, is similar in both of these uh, uh, images. We also have a high viability yet here, 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 7. And so as you go across, you can see, you know, the different biocides have different uh, biofilm removal effects. <coughs> After one hour, there's, um, not much removal compared to the control. Um, perhaps TTPC is, is um, showing some of the best removal. After four hours, you can see some uh, you know, more, more removal uh, going on. Uh, you'll notice THPS really doesn't um, improve its biofilm removal um, from uh, one hour to four hours. TTPC is, is looking pretty good similar to blue uh, plot and biofilm removal. So again, there's difference, uh, you know, different characteristics here between these different products. Uh, and why would you want to remove the biofilm? Well, residual biofilm is going to prevent any, any types of corrosion inhibitors getting to the surface. So it's going to be much more, your corrosion inhibitor program is going to be a lot more effective if you not only kill that biofilm, but remove it. Uh, just one more comment. Um, 
you know, some of these products, uh, some of them are small, non-ionic, you know, uh, uh, type of products, but um, your ad back type product, your TTPC, these are surfactant-like molecules. So um, they do tend to work a little better at, uh, at removing the biofilm. So what we did um, at this point is, uh, you know, we know that uh, THPS is a, a popular product in, in oil and gas applications as a biocide. Um, and we saw that, you know, when you add a, you know, one of these surfactant type products to the mix, you get good biofilm removal. So we looked at, we looked at a combination of the THPS and the TTPC to see if, you, if we would see any benefit combining those two products together. Um, this is the um, viability results. Um, THPS by itself, um, at 100 ppm, you're seeing a three log and a four log reduction. Um, TTPC at 50 ppm, we're seeing a four and four log reduction. If you combine these two products uh, at a, a two to one ratio, you can see it gets um, improved performance um, of the mixture compared to the, uh, the individual products uh, at a much higher dose. So we were encouraged by this uh, result. And if you look at the uh, biofilm removal, you know, we do see very good uh, results here now with the combination. Um, even slightly better than, than the TTPC uh, by itself. So you're able to reduce uh, the concentration of these biocides by half and still get um, as good activity from as, as the individual products itself at a higher dosage. So I think that's what I had for uh, FC data. And uh, George is going to talk a little bit about a field trial with these products. Any questions for Jeff? Yeah. Well, Adbax is cationic, and uh, have you run tests with the, like, say, hyperfracturing, like FR and scale inhibitors, which are anion? Do right. they affect the, uh, the performance at all? Right. So uh, I don't know about Adbax, that's not our product, but um, with the TTPC, the other cationic uh, product that's in there, we have done that testing. Uh, we've looked at it against, you know, two different, uh, very common cationic, uh, I'm sorry, anionic friction reducers. Uh, we didn't see any negative effect on the friction reduction properties or on the biocidal properties. And uh, this is something um, that is consistent with our experience in using TTPC in the cooling water market where you have a lot of anionic inhibitors there and it, it tends to show better compatibility with, with those uh, anionic scale inhibitors compared to ADVAC. Yeah, uh, the level of cationic charge is the significant. This on ADVAC is, uh, that's pretty strong. Yeah, the TTPC, the, the, you know, the phosphorus atom at the core of it is larger so you have a more diffuse positive charge. Yeah. Plus you have uh, more bulky groups around that phosphorus atom, so it kind of protects, you know, or prevents that, you know, positive negative interaction from occurring. Anything else? Vince? Could you talk a little bit about how you were making measurements of uh, bacteria without the Is that some sort of microscopic method or PCR or right. Um, yeah, so those uh, pictures with the little green dots, uh, basically we use a fluorescent dye, um, uh, it's fluorescein isothiocyanate, it reacts with proteins. So it's a very common you know, histological dye. Um, you just, uh, you know, you make up a dilute concentration of that, um, you know, expose the coupons to that uh, dye, rinse, you know, rinse a couple of times, and then you can look at it under a fluorescent microscope. If you were measuring like uh, water chemistry and fill, you know, to produce water, how, how would you go about that? Right. 
So if you if you want to look at biofilm in an industrial system, you need a you need some type of removable substrate, right? So you need you know a corrosion coupon or some kind of school piece that you can take out of the system and then um, you know apply some of these techniques to whether it's you know swabbing to remove the biofilm and then and then counting the organisms that are on the swab or if it's a you know if it's a corrosion coupon that's a lot easier you can you can um, remove the, the organisms from the surface through sonication and then do counting or you can look at it you know look at it visually under a light microscope or even a, an SEM and, uh, light microscope you might want to do staining SEM you, know, you can see the organism directly so yeah so you need some kind of removable piece from the system that you can work with Yes, um, well, I think a lot of literature that we see um, they recommend using uh, hygiene at ATP dish slide. It's not necessarily the biofilms, but the sealers as well. Sure. Um, do you guys use that? Have you seen any issues with using that to produce water? Because we've kind of seen some low biases um, in, in produce water. I don't know if the salt interferes with the yeah. reaction that produces the light. Yeah, so ATP, you know, is is uh, used a lot in the field because it'll give you you know quick results, right? We don't we don't use that a lot in the lab because you know we're uh, more of a you know, research environment, so we're doing these kind of culture tests. Um, so I can't really say what might be affecting you know the ATP counts uh, with that type of test. I'm, I would imagine the supplier would have some. Some knowledge about that, and be able to give you some guidance on you know, what affects its, you know, where to use it, where not to use it. Okay, let's uh, I'll just do it this way. Um, yeah, I wanted just to look, go over our case history to kind of show you a little bit about a little bit about how effective some of these products are, and also I think I think a few people brought up a very good point. I think Steve brought this up that you know, prevention is important. You know, proactively treating a system is extremely important for corrosion and have you. And it's really it's very true in this in this area because you know as we've seen, you know, biofilm is the big problem. We're trying to control that. You know, that's where the, the under deposit corrosion occurs. That's where the issues are. So you know, managing that's important. Well, if there are no bacteria present in the blood water to create that biofilm, you solve part of that problem. So again, being proactive, keeping your blood counts low, prior to them colonizing is very important. So this uh, case history that I'll talk about here is essentially, this is a, an SPE paper from 2009. It's now, actually Nalco Champion did this. Uh, it's a real nice piece of work. Um, the key sort of the author is very involved in the ACE and has done some very good uh, publications uh, and presentations at SPE. And what they did was they were looking at a uh, injection well, uh, well in the Bakken, and they were using THPS to, to control the bacteria, but they weren't getting complete kill, and they were seeing very high corrosion rates. Uh, one of the one of the issues with THPS is that it is a fairly aggressive chemistry when it comes to corrosion, so you're kind of you know you're killing the bugs, but you're also creating some other issues uh, with the metallurgy. So what they were gonna, what they're trying to do in this study was look at adding an adjunct, another biocide, uh, to help kill more bacteria and hopefully also to reduce the corrosion rates. And you know, if there's anything you can take from this few, few slides I'm going to talk about, it's the fact that I think a lot of the industry is really starting to appreciate the fact that you know, the use of two biocides, which we've kind of been doing that a lot in the industrial water side for many years, that is a very potent way of, to treat a lot of these systems. Um, you know, a lot of people will, like, if they're treating uh, frac water, they'll, they'll have biocide on the fly. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're bringing in uh, flowback water that's maybe been mixed with fresh water and it's maybe been sitting around for a while, that, that water may have a lot of bacteria in it. So you're bringing in some you know, pretty nasty water. If you keep that water clean, you're, like I said, you're, you're adding that extra level of protection so that water is as clean as possible goes into your, uh, into your frac job. So uh, a lot of, I mean, I'm not a microbiologist, but a lot of times uh, you know, microbiologists will go into a plant, they'll do a plant audit, and they'll show all the areas where you know, microbes can infiltrate and cause problems. It's the same kind of thing you do in, in, in the oil and gas area. It's like, where's my water coming from? Where's it been? 
Uh, you know, has it been stored in a, in a containment pond that may be dirty? Um, was it transferred in a truck uh, that may have had you know, a lot of bacteria in it? Maybe that water was pumped out, but there was sludge in it and it's never been cleaned out. So all those kind of things, you have to think about the, the history of where the water's been and, and its bacterial content. So it's all very important. So in this particular study, uh, you know, they did this joint uh, biocide treatment and they actually got improved results. So what do they do? Uh, so this was, like I said, a, a water injection well system. Um, it's basically a few miles long. Uh, and they were actually adding biocide here at the beginning. And you can see that there was a, uh, you know, a one mile transfer line here to uh, transfer inlet and also an injection plant about a mile or so down, down the way. And then about three quarters of a mile down, we actually got to the injection hole area. So the study was set up to look at um, the GHPS uh, at different, do different dosages, actually the same contact time here, uh, and then different duration times. And then also looking at this cobiocide treatment, and then going back to, to GHPS. And I'm gonna show some MPY results. Even though these uh, treatment duration times are different, all the data has been normalized based on time. So we're actually we're doing an apples to apples comparison across the board. So what they, they did here is they, uh, at the end of each treatment, they took corrosion coupons out and then replaced them with new ones. These were all sort of subsequent type treatment. So they started with the first one, pulled the coupons out, put in new coupons once the second one started. So that's kind of the protocol. I actually pulled this from the paper, and I thought it was a little confusing, but I wanted to basically show you what was in the paper. The, the take home here is that uh, in many cases, in all cases actually, both biocides were very good at killing sulfate reducing bacteria, diesel, sulfate bacterium right here. But the THPS, in this case the white bar, first white bar here, uh, wasn't doing a real good job at killing the eubacteria or the iron reducing bacteria. So the addition of the, the second biocide, the GTPC, uh, is right over here. And you can see that there were significantly reduced counts uh, using that type of biocide. Uh, and that pretty much carried through to each different uh, injection point or sampling point. And in some cases, we actually saw some regrowth after the second biocide was taken out and it went back into strict THPS. So, what this shows is that you know the sulfate reducers are being taken care of, but iron reducing bacteria can cause, you know, create organic acids that cause corrosion. There are other bacteria in, in the system that can be uh, problematic. So they were getting much better microbial control across the different species using the two biocides. And this is just a picture that's showing the, the corrosion coupons, uh, the different sampling points. And again, the key thing here is if you look at the combination treatment, you can see that it's mainly generalized corrosion, no pitting, uh, and the corrosion rates are, are significantly lower relative to just using the THPS by itself. And I don't know how this shows up here in the, in the slide, but corrosion coupons left to right, uh, 75 ppm THPS, 100 ppm THPS in combination. Uh, that, that coupon was pretty good. So again, um, the key thing is you know, as Jeff showed earlier, um, you know, THPS biocide wasn't a real good biocide, biofilm removal type biocide, but adding the, the surface active TTPC helped with that biofilm treatment. So the other thing that we also are starting to find out uh, is that some of these biocides actually have film forming properties. Uh, so the, the TTPC uh, molecule in particular uh, shows mild steel corrosion protection and also some, uh, some copper metal corrosion condition. Uh, so we're not really sure exactly what that mechanism is, but we think it's a passivation type mechanism that you commonly see with, with organic materials. So, uh, so again, I think that's quite more about it. This is our summary for the whole presentation. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the biofilm control is very essential for mitigation of MIC. As Jeff showed, you know, there is variation in terms of what the biocides can do in terms of you know, both bacterial kill and biofilm removal. Uh, and a lot of these combination products 
uh, especially those that have a surface active type biocide like ABAP or TTPC, uh, are very good in terms of you know, overall control of the biofilm uh, versus just using individual biocides. Uh, so, so that's basically what we're, we're, you know, we want to have to share with you. So are there any additional questions related to the case history or anything else for, for Jeff and I that we can answer questions? I have a few minutes.